Sidney Jones was instantly recognisable from his roles, small and large, in many, many British films, usually comedies, but not only comedies. Of course, his major success in the 1950s was starring opposite Tony Hancock in Hancock's Half Hour. But as the 50s waned and we came into the 60s, he started making another series, and this would become his true legendary series and also his pension plan. It was, of course, the Carry Ons. I met him in 1972, not on the set of a Carry On, but on a film version of his very successful TV series, Bless This House. He was a delight, totally relaxed, totally without any uh, snobbery or s snideness and his attitude to everything was joyful and excited and enthusiastic, as I hope you'll hear from this recording. He had to go and film his scenes during our conversation, but as you'll hear, there was no real interruption in the flow of our conversation. It was like two old friends getting together and just sitting, having a drink. He was a delight and his legacy lives on with the continued popularity of the Carry On series and of course his famous very dirty laugh. <laughs> Then Tony went on his own, and uh, he was doing marvellously well, old town, until he made the big bloomer, I think, of uh, not having Galton and Simpson write for him anymore. And that's where things started to go wrong, for a boy, and, uh, but anyway, we're not talking about Tony now, I think enough's been said about Tony. And, uh, Then I just got lucky. I didn't ever want to be um, the sort of name that... Uh, I don't like you, use of the word star because I'm very, very far removed from being a star. I mean, it looks like Olivia and, uh, and uh, Newman and these fellows. These are stars, you know. I mean, they're really... Burton and Liz Taylor, these are all sorts of... This bloody word is so thrown about and so misused. You know, everybody whose name's above the title is called a star. <laughs> You look at you know, man, it's ridiculous, isn't it? I think, especially with me. So I, playing lead, I didn't think I'd ever be sort of responsible for a show. I didn't uh, want that. All I ever wanted was to be first feature or first supporting player. And you got a long life in the game if you do it that way. Talking of long life, were you ever threatened? I know it's a very hard life being mm -hmm. that. Were you ever threatened by a serious illness or anything like that? Only I had a coronary which was uh, bad enough. That was about uh, four or five years ago. I can't remember. How long ago was it? About four or five years ago. So I had a coronary, a nasty one, and I wasn't, wasn't able to work for uh, about six months, I think. But uh, I was lucky there because Jerry wanted me back in uh, Carry On Doctor. Yeah, carry on, doctor. And uh, it was my first job after the coronary. And they uh, wrote in a part for me as a patient. I was in bed most of the time <laughs> in that particular picture. So that was did, handy. Did the coronary change your life at all? Did oh, yes. You cut down or anything? You just slow down? Oh, yes. I had a slow down. I still work as hard, but without the anxiety. Now it's uh, one job at a time instead of two or three, and uh, no more cigarettes. Got to be careful with the food, keep my weight down. I can't go to the gym anymore. No more boxing. You can't. No, I keep myself fit. Workouts every morning, but fairly gentle ones, not like I used to be. I used to want muscles all the time. No, I don't want any muscles. You don't need muscles to pick a bottle up, really, do you? <laughs>
You um, did a few healing comms. Is that, am I right in saying you were in the Lady Killers as well? No, I wasn't in the Lady Killers. You were in the Lavender Hill. Lavender Hill, right? Lavender Hill Titfield, Thunderbolt. Uh, You'd never looking through the records. I simply cannot remember. It I've done about 230 odd pictures now. Yeah, and, and it shows, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> <In the comments>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you feel that perhaps the Indian comedies were a bit more nearer to the spirit of English humour than perhaps the Carry Ons are? I mean, everyone says you know Carry Ons is too ah, well. You English can't. Humor. You can't possibly compare them. Uh, the Ealing comedies were absolutely 100% real things. They were real comedies about real people. And they were fabulous, the Ealing comedies. So they, they were really warm. Uh, there was never any, uh, any dirt or any, uh, any dodgy gags in them. There was never, never anything like that. The carry-ons are a completely different setup. Uh, I think the only English thing about the carry-ons is that they're sort of seaside postcard yeah, humour. Do you think the English Boarding. thing about it is that they beat around the bush, you know, they don't actually come out and say what they really mean. It's a very nudging sort of humour. I don't think that's typically English. No, I don't think so. Have you seen... Uh, any American shows, they do the same type thing. Uh, better interior decorators. The, the, sets, the sets perhaps look a bit better. Really. Yeah, it's the same kind be. of thing. But uh, the Karen's, uh, it's just uh, a wonderful format that suddenly uh, happened, and uh, I think it's been grabbed as being typically English, but I don't really think it's typically English. Have you? Do you see any carry-ons with an audience? I mean, do you go? Oh, several times. Because uh, I noticed when I've seen them that there's, the audience is geared to laughter. And Straight whatever, away. It seems to me whatever you do... Well, the point you know, is that the carry-ons, they've established so much goodwill over the years that the customers know what to expect when they go in. And they get it. Yeah. And that's the secret. Did you uh, read that your performance as King Henry VIII was compared very favourably to that? I <laughs> know, <laughs> where did you read that? That's in films and filming God uh, last year. So that must have been written better. by my dad. <laughs> 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 I didn't know hear that one. Yeah. I saw the bloke the other night when he was comparing the Henrys on television. Did you see him, uh, that Australian fella? He was a bit rude about Burton. He said, Burton is always Burton. He's wearing different clothes. I think Burton, if Burton ever hears that, he'll thump him. <laughs> no, but then he got to me and he said, that we, he showed the different Henry VIII, Lawton and, um, and Burton. And Bob Shaw, Keith Michelle, yes, and uh, Lawton, and Lawton, <laughs> and Lawton. <laughs> and then he said, and now we come to the strangest enemy of them all, with utter vulgarity. <laughs> <laughs> and they picked the cleanest clip of the lot. The thing is that probably you were nearer to him than perhaps the others were, because you know perhaps he was much much cruder than uh, the others dared make it because of the times he lived. I really wouldn't know. <laughs> all I know is that having read about him and everything else, I think he was a bit of a pig. It's all I can say. <laughs> and I hope I didn't play it like a pig. No, I uh, I enjoyed playing Henry. I must say, I really did. The hell of playing Henry. God, I'll never forget. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. I had, <laughs> do you remember? I had just arrived back that morning from... No. Yes, yeah, South Africa. I had just arrived. They were arrived back on the plane. They put the schedule forward. I left South Africa on the Saturday night. Or the Sunday morning, I can't remember. Or the Sunday night. I arrived at London Airport. The car was waiting for me. And they rushed me out to Windsor Great Park, right, was it? Straight onto the biggest bloody horse you ever saw in your life. And I didn't have the proper gear on underneath. You know, when you go riding on one of these great things and you go galloping across uh, various places and uh, I didn't have the right underwear on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I had another problem. I can't remember. Oh yes, on top of everything else, I had diarrhoea, which was not very pleasant. I coughed it. And the stallion, the biggest bloody horse you ever saw in your life. And of course, I didn't. Well, between my stomach and my other problems, without the proper underwear, <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't finish up sounding like a choir boy. <laughs> Straight into the mud, into the d mud, yeah. No mercy at all. That's when I had to go and push the coin into Maggie Nolan's boobies, wasn't it? <laughs> That's the clip they showed. Yeah. Oh, we have a hell of a lot of fun on the carry-on. We really do. The things that go on. Quite extraordinary. The, it's just one hysterical laugh from start to finish. Not at the jokes, at each other. Yeah. It really is. Joan Sims is a, a, the most incredible clown off stage. She really is quite extraordinary. She is so extra, but she doesn't care what she does or says, and she flops about. <laughs> She's hysterical. And of course, I walk home every night with my eyes looking like monkey's titties. They're all puffed <laughs> up from laughing. <laughs> oh, God. She's a funny lady. She really is. We have so many of them. Oh, no, happy. No? I think Hattie Hattie Jakes seems Hattie's to me as a great serious. strategian, actually. Yeah. She could have been a serious actress if she'd been given well, a Well, she's a very good actress, Hattie. A very good actress. Very good indeed. But because someone is, you know, plump, everyone yeah, thinks ha-ha, that's, nice. that's very amusing. But you've got to be, I think, you've got to be a good actor, really, to be a good comic. I mean, in, in certain type of comic, I don't mean uh, slapstick or... Mind you, you still got to be, you got to know what you're doing, whatever it is, you've got to be professional, but um, acting comics, like you get Jack Lemmon, I think he's tremendous. Um, comedy actor type fellow, you've got to be a very good actor to get your timing and to get your reactions. And well, it strikes me in the scene I saw you doing, when you say a line, it can be just a very ordinary line, but what is goes into saying it, you know, the experience behind it, like with your wife, it's you know, of all the years of, you know, all the things that she's done perhaps before, you have to put in a single line. Well, then, yes, you, you've got to think yourself into it. If you don't mm -hmm. think, I think the most important thing about any show or any, anything you're doing, when I get a film script, for instance, I read the, I learn the entire script. I don't like just sort of coming the night before and I do well, they phone me up the night before and say, you are doing scenes 12, 18, and 32 tomorrow, whatever it is, and then learning that scene, or having looked at it for the first time, which is what a lot of actors do, it's a bit silly. I like to read the entire script, and I make notes to mood and continuity and what happened last time, what my thoughts are. And it's very important just to remind you, so when you do get the call the next day, you don't have to do a lot of sweating about uh, what you're going to do with it. Then I feel business is important, too. It's no good just... Um, if you're trying to get laughs, anyway, I mean, if you, maybe just picking up a cup. If you've got to say something, you're picking up a cup and saying the lines. The lines may not be funny enough. If the lines aren't funny enough, you've got to do something funny. Or wear a funny hat, pull a funny face. The, the old business of picking up, I mean, I've done this a million times. You pick up a cup and the bloody saucer comes with it. You know the sort of thing that happens to you? When the saucer sticks to the cup and you pick it up, well, haven't you had that? Oh, that's happened to me. It's always at the Duchess's party. <laughs> Get around in the cool. It's a little cooler. It's very humid, this bloody set. It's like jungle. You remember that? On jungle. All that water all over the place and the heat. We had our own jungle here. That was carry on up, up the jungle. Yeah. God, it was murder. Now, what can we talk about? Um, Oh, yeah, I'm saying it's always a giggle. And I think in every single carry on I've ever done, I've been soaked to the skin. There's not once that I've missed. And I think Tolly Rothwell now does it on purpose. I've been in everything. God, I'm in the lot. Cement, water, mud, manure. That was very nice, that was. Mm -hmm. oh. 
<laughs> yeah, my bloody sure is no real manure. <laughs> this isn't the devil's, you know. <laughs> um, I nearly got drowned in one. Oh, no, that wasn't a carry-on. That was uh, upstairs and downstairs. That was Claudia Cardinale's first film. Remember it? Mike Craig. Um, oh, I can't remember the other name. Hayward, that's right. And I was a cop in that, supposed to be putting out, a, trying to put out the cooker that was on fire, and they had the studio fireman there, aiming the hose at me, supposed to knock my helmet off. And he said, for God's sake, don't open your mouth, because I was getting the full blast of this thing. And if you've ever stood in front of a fire hose that's coming at you, believe me, it just knocks you all over the place. And uh, he kept saying to Rafe Thomas, the director, I don't think it's advisable, and I had to shout as he was doing it, cut it out! Stop it! Yoy! And he said, I don't think Mr. James should do that, because if he gets the water in his mouth, he could drown if he gets the force of that thing down. Rafe said, no, aim at these hands, it'll be all right. So we tried a couple of hearses with mouth shut, and he knocked my helmet off twice without me. Well, I got wet, of course, but he didn't hit me in the face at all. That's when my mouth was shut. We then did it with my mouth open, and I was nearly drowned. <laughs> they had to give me artificial respiration. I'm not kidding, this is gospel. They had to pump me for hours. And all that whiskey that I lost. Hmm? What a go straight down. Can't stop it. Knock me over. <laughs> then I got up and I wanted to belt the fireman. <laughs> They're not getting it right. And I knocked myself out on carry on regardless. I had to take a dive down some stairs into a sort of cellar. Well, it, would, it looked, you only saw the doorway, and I had to take a dive down, and I had it padded all the way around. And we did three rehearsals, and it was great. I was hitting the padding. And then on the take, I must have missed the padding, and I hit the timber prop at the end. I went out like a light, and they're all waiting for me to come up again. <laughs> and here he says, are you all right, Tim? And finally I sort of came around, you know, it wasn't a complete knockout, but it knocked me silly for a minute. I got to the top, then went out again like a light and fell down again, down the same hole. Lightning never strikes twice, who said that? <laughs> No, I've had some little beauties. I, I went straight over a camera with a I'm tit for a thunderbolt. <laughs> 20,000 quid worth of camera I flattened with a steamroller. Couldn't control it. <laughs> you know, and the blokes couldn't move as fast enough. The bloody steamroller only did three miles an hour, but they were petrified. That was popular. Stopped shooting for a week. They got into <laughs> Yeah. Filming with the Americans is a lot of fun because they're um, very, very, very professional. I'm not saying that ours aren't, but the Americans really, uh, American actors and actresses, people like Katie Hepburn and Paul Douglas and uh, Joan Crawford. You were with her on the Iron Pesco, were you? With Katie, yeah. Yes. She's fantastic. As much of a challenge to you as, as you'd like, you know, would you think of doing something a bit more? Oh, I'm past challenges, mate. I've had enough of those. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want, no, I don't want any more challenges, thank you very much. I'm not the sort of bloke who... Uh, uh, I enjoy acting, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't do it. And uh, quite frankly, it's the easiest way I know of making a living, especially filming. But uh, television is very hard work, no question about it. That is the hardest, the toughest. And it's, when you're doing a series, a long series, 12, 13 weeks, it's a week's rehearsal and then you do the show and you get a day off and then another week's rehearsal and you're learning lines and learning lines and learning lines. And it's really drudgery, hard work. Do I take this immediately or do you have well, then you, you take it and then you No, 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 it would be nice if you could do that. But we do, we record it with an audience. Of course, it's edited afterwards, it's all put together properly, especially if there's any costume changes and they have to wait. But uh, it's done as a show, and uh, you try to get it clean the first time. You don't want to have to do any retakes. 
How do you manage to get peace and quiet at home? Do are your children at home while they're bored? Well, the boy's working. What does he do? He's working at EMI at the moment. He wants to be a sound engineer, and he's starting right at the bottom. Mm. My daughter, Susan, goes to the lycée. And uh, she's been there since she was five, I think, five or six. Speaks beautiful French. I think she speaks French better than Pompey did, personally. <laughs> and uh, ready for common market. Yes, no, she's great, and she speaks very good Spanish. She's um, have a kid. She's only fourteen. But, uh, no, we relax pretty well at home. I'm a good relaxer. I, I love taking it easy. I like more than anything fishing and lying in the sun. Was well, this what? before your car? Or no, not? I've always liked You've that. Always been a good I used relaxer. to love going up to the gym every day. Yeah. Feeling fit. I had a gym at home. I used to drive my work potty, especially when I worked on the punch ball. Because it used to make a bit of a racket in the house and shake the room, shake the house about it. Yeah. But since the coronary, that's all gone. I've broken the gym down and given the bits and pieces away to boys' clubs and things. And uh, so my pleasure now is just to go fishing and. Uh, I don't even play golf anymore because it's too much aggravation. That's, that's just it. Lie around the swimming pool and enjoy it. What don't you like about the business? Actually? What, show business? Yes. Oh, I love show business. What do you think about the casualty rate in show business? Well, that's pretty terrifying. I mean, you've got to be very lucky in show business. But when you do get the luck, you, I mean, when you finally get lucky, you've got to use it. No question about that. I don't, I don't think, and I'm not being beheaded about this, I'm not referring to myself so much, because I have a, a hell of a lot of luck. But if you uh, do get the brakes and you're able to use them, I think you've got to have a certain talent of some kind to stay, to keep the brakes with you, to keep the luck going. You can't keep going if you're a lousy performer, unless you're a, an absolute personality. But you don't find any bad performance lasting very long, really. I don't think so. Do you remember any advice that was given to you? Oh, God, there's all kinds of advice you get, you know. I, wonder. I think the main thing is uh, an experience. You know, I've been at it so long now. I really have, you know, I've done a hell of a lot of everything now and uh, you learn every day another little something that uh, I mean my father taught me a lot when I was very young things like basic things we finished the act and he'd say uh, smile we were taking our bow you know he said I am smiling smile you little bastard my right, tough Aussie he said I am smiling and he put me on stage, he said, bang! <laughs> I did a big laugh at the audience, and you smile, you little son. And we get on stage, and he said, why don't you bloody smile? I said, I was smiling. He said, you're not smiling. He said, look there, look at the mirror there. He said, now smile. So I said, he said, no, feel it, for Christ's sake, feel it. And it's quite true. You go on stage, and you see a lot of people lining up on a call or on a taking a final call or a curtain or something. I mean, I know I've directed, you know, a few of my children, they're like, they're mad at them. I said, for Christ's sake, smile. And I say exactly what my father told me. You can you're not smiling until you feel it. Actually feel the smile. Little things like that, it's sort of basic thing. A lot of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, I wouldn't bother about staying late tonight, but we've got people for dinner and I'll yeah. go fine. That's what I wanted. Oh yeah. Well, not just a little. You know. I mean, to have it as hot as Jerry, you can make tea with it. <laughs> Steam coming off it in this weather. Instead of like you know, you dive into an ordinary swimming pool, you say, "Christ, it's cold." And to Jerry, you go, "Christ, it's hot." <laughs> yeah, let me get out. It's too hot. <laughs> Can I just ask you about one thing? Uh, um, you worked with Margaret Rutherford, didn't you? Yeah. The solid gold Wonderful Cadillac. Lady. Um, on stage. We'll be on something else as well. Um, Would you like to be remembered for? The losers I've backed.
Does it, he first lives white one, here, the first white one, the Jaguar Dave. He lives in Virginia Water, doesn't he? Um, so? No, Ivor. Oh, Ivor, so it's very, very close, yeah. isn't it? Five minutes down the road. Yeah. Dave and his wife got a triumph um, out uh, stag. Yeah. She, was she an actress or nothing no, to do with the no. business? The carrions are made not so that they don't interfere with summer seasons, and they don't interfere with pantomime. Yeah. So that after the, the uh, carry on is normally made just as the pantomime season ends. And the next one is, um, and there's also one that finishes, sorry, after the pantomime season ends, but before um, the summer season start, summer shows start, then the next one is made after the summer shows, but before pantomime, you know, so it's between, between so in fact, if they if they were only in there, they could spend the year uh, maybe a carry on followed by summer season, talking or wherever or the Australia is uh, then another carry on, then ten yeah. yeah. I noticed that Kenneth Connor seems to have been slipping farther and farther down the castles because in the the early ones where he yeah, was, was sort of you know in the top and no, he seems almost to be included in sort of an act of charity almost. <laughs> yeah. uh, and yet, you see, in, um, in very small parts in Kerala, um, in the convenience of the at all, no children not too well. Hi, David. Um, carry on abroad, it's, it's uh, I'm out here. Uh, yes. Most of them fluctuate. But I mean, well, with Sid, he's always on the yeah. top, apart from yeah. yeah. Frankie Howard. And, and some things are contractual, um, anyway. Right. There's, there's, there's some, I know on stuff I send abroad on you know, advertising credits and this sort of thing, there's, um, there's one part written in that Charles Hawtrey has to be somewhere in, uh, he can't be lower than fourth down the list. Yeah. 